So we have approximately 90 minutes. See, my goal would be simple that uh, for the next 90 minutes, simple goal, that no matter what question is asked, you are able to analyze things at a foundational level. Of course, you cannot read everything. You cannot read everything in the newspapers. There will be days when you may not get the time. And despite no knowledge of any subject, you should be in a position to make conjectures about the world, policies, happenings of the world. And most importantly, how all those things will perhaps affect India. So I think I can cover all both the aspects today only. The first aspect pertains to international affairs and second, second will pertain to economics. Second half is going to be magical with around 30 minutes of discussion in the second half. No matter what question is asked from economics, it does not matter whether you have studied the budget and analyzed it with the economic survey or not. You should be in a good position to give decent views on the issues that touch economics. For you, Isha, different story. Uh, but for Chandra Prabha, this will benefit immensely. Okay. Uh, Isha, you will have to go through those approximately 30 episodes. Yes. Once a day. Okay. So I'll leave out the second half for second half. And that's when things get interesting. But before I talk about economics, uh, what is happening in the world? Red Sea, Iran, Pakistan, especially with Iran, Pakistan, what's happening? And why is it happening? Let's watch a quick video and just tell me your observations. consulted with the U.S. before the airstrikes in Iran. Is it true? So a member of uh, the media in Pakistan have reported that Pakistani authorities consulted with the U.S. before the airstrikes in Iran. Is it true? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I do not have any private conversations to read out. What the administration thinks of the situation between Iran and Pakistan right now, and how concerned are you that this could uh, escalate into uh, potentially, uh, at least on one side and maybe on both sides, a nuclear conflict. So we are concerned about escalating tensions in the region. It's been something, as you know, we've spoken about a number of times, it's something we've focused on. We've been incredibly concerned about uh, the potential for escalation since October 7th, and that's why we have engaged in intense diplomatic efforts to try to prevent escalation. So um, I will say we noted the comments from uh, the government of Pakistan uh, about the importance of cooperative relations between Pakistan and its neighbors. We thought those were productive, uh, useful statements. Um, and uh, certainly, there's no need for escalation. And we would um, uh, urge restraint on all sides in this case. Yeah, so what is happening? What is happening with Iran and Pakistan? Why is there a tussle between the two countries? Nisha? Pakistan has recently carried out an strike in Iran in retaliation to actions of Iran uh, against Pakistan. However, I'm not, uh, I'm yet to find more details about the uh, exact reason. Yeah, okay, Chandrapa, what are your thoughts? Iran was targeting a Shia uh, militant leader and a group in Balochistan. Uh, they have said that their purpose was to strike at terrorism, so it was more targeted. Whereas Pakistan, of course, has come up with, um, is also stating reports where civilians were attacked. And uh, after that, they have also done retali retaliatory strikes against uh, militants in Iran. Okay. India has mentioned India's recent statement was that they respect a country's right to self-defense, but also that uh, the countries should uh, observe rest restraint. Okay. So this is this is exactly how many of your peers will respond. Nothing wrong with that. 
but let's understand what's happening and why is it happening. Iran was accused of violating the Pakistani airspace and sovereignty. Is Pakistan a sovereign country? It's debatable. Let's not go there. So in retaliation, Pakistan carried out military strikes inside Iran, targeting the Baluchi militants. But the question is why? What was the need for Iran to conduct missile and drone strikes within Pakistan? Aren't these two friendly countries? If you think about this, Pakistan is a significant market for Iranian exports. Despite the trade sanctions on Iran, Pakistan still continues to engage in trade with Iran. Iran is a key supplier of electricity to many parts in Pakistan. There is notable amount of unofficial trade, be it in LPG or diesel, that happens. In fact, a few months ago, Pakistan had passed a special order to allow barter trade with Iran for certain goods, be it petroleum, be it natural gas, and many more things. Special order was passed. They did it to make it easier to trade, even when you have sanctions, the American sanctions in Iran. Not just economic interest, Pakistan, Iran, they have a border of 900 kilometers. And they collaborate on that border for various reasons, be it to combat extremism, address the drug trafficking, human trafficking, weapons traffic, trafficking, anything else where they are collaborating, Iran, Pakistan. There was a very important meeting that took place, perhaps in June. Go on, Chandrava. Uh, the recent one I can recall is the one in Davos that happened between the two foreign ministers. But I'm not sure if that's the one you needed. Okay. In Davos meetings are happen just for the heck of happening. Those are not scheduled meetings. Stability in Afghanistan, very critical for both Iran and Pakistan. They both have seen influx of Afghan refugees. In fact, the meeting that I'm speaking of is from June 2023. A top Iranian Navy commander, Shahram Irani, he visited Pakistan for official discussions on improving the bilateral military cooperation. Pakistan, Iran, they pledged to improve military to military ties. Many aspects of border security, counterterrorism, all those aspects were discussed. So if they're collaborating at such lengths, from economics to military to border, what changed immediately? Or is this immediate? Out in the open, Iran has said that strikes were aimed at militant group, groups that were operating in the Balochistan region, particularly this Jash Aladl. Right? But why now? In fact, this group has been in town for so many years, for 12 years. And they have openly claimed responsibilities for several attacks against the Iranian military personnel. In 2012, they, this, this group, which operates from Balochistan, they killed 10 members of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard. It was out in the open. In 2013, again, same story. 14 border guards were killed. Same outfit. 2015, same story. 2017, same story. 2019, same story. So it's not a new thing. Why would, pa why would Iran violate Pakistani airspace? Of course, you all are giving me the same reason that those attacks happen, but this has been happening for so many years. And Prabha, you have to add something? No, just with regards to why now, I'm just thinking that... Uh... There's something to do with the current conditions that are going on. Iran's role with Israel and Hamas as well, but I'm not able to place it exactly. Why now? What would they benefit by leveraging this timing and the conditions? That Isha, is any thoughts? What if they ask you in the interview? You just mentioned uh, that, you know, there was a terrorist outfit that they have obliterated. 
but why now this outfit was existed existing for so many years there is a concern that uh, these actions are in response to the uh, israel hamas conflict uh, even the red the happenings in the red sea the houthi rebels are supported by iran so but why would they attack pakistan why would they violate the airspace of pakistan for example one of the reason for the rivalry between iran and saudi arabia is the difference in their religious ideologies then why are they collaborating saudi iran thing has been in existence for so many years in 2023 i just mentioned that the yes the naval commander is visiting pakistan signing so many important treaties with pakistan they were collaborating for a for a, a even military exercises and whether we like it or not again yeah. pakistan iran they share 900 kilometers of border <laughs> Tantrava, anything? Any? Are you able to frame? No. Okay. See, because foreign policy and more so decisions as tough as these are always dictated by domestic underpinnings. Now, what does this mean? Why is that India conducted its surgical strike? Before twenty nineteen general elections, what was the reason? Why is it that Benjamin Netanyahu benefits the most out of the Israel Hamas war? When Israel decides to obliterate Hamas, what was the political situation in Israel? Israel at that time was grappling with significant economic challenges. Israelis were frustrated with high unemployment rates, growing fiscal deficit. In fact, before October twenty twenty three, there were significant protests in Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu's government faced backlash over the plans when they were to overhaul the judicial system. If you remember, before this October fiasco, Israeli government it proposed a legislation to strip the Israeli Supreme Court of some of the oversight's power. Because of this, there were massive nationwide protests. Not just that there were corruption charges against the ruling parties in Israel, the political leaders of that party. So looks like uniting the country against the common enemy, especially in context to Israel, was a phenomenal opportunity. Because a common external threat can foster a sense of unity, solidarity amongst the citizens. And for political leaders, it's it's magic, a unifying external threat. can provide an opportunity to consolidate power this is the perfect opportunity for leaders to strengthen their position and gain support from groups those groups that could be perhaps in opposition could be neutral and this has happened in case of india has happened in case of israel focusing on external enemy divert public attention from domestic problems economic issues social political scandals in fact there's a term used in international politics for this it's called as diversionary war a beautiful concept in international affairs it is a concept that many successful prime ministers presidents have leveraged time and again when bill clinton when he bombed iraq for 4 days why did he do that because if you think about it that was the time when he wanted to divert attention from his ongoing impeachment proceedings clinton had a very interesting relationship with one of his interns in the white house monica lewinsky and not a surprise that garnered a lot of media attention public attention from iraq people might forget all that mess perfect example of diversionary war any other example in our modern day history was clinton alone 
Falkland Wars, 1982, immensely benefited Margaret Thatcher. Ronald Reagan, known for this, he invaded a country, I think an island, Granada, in 18, 1983. Why? Because he was immensely unpopular around that time. And how to win back that trust? External enemy. Let's forget about the US for a second, or UK for a second, or Israel for a second. Talk about Pakistan. Kargil conflict, 1999. What was happening in Pakistan around that time? Economic challenges, political instability. And by the way, that Kargil conflict saw surge in patriotic fervor in Pakistan initially. Of course, it dwindled at the far end. So to simply put, Whenever a leader faces domestic or internal political challenges, looks like, I haven't made a conclusion yet, but it looks like they want to initiate international conflict, divert attention, and analysts call it the diversionary war. From four days bombing in Iraq by Clinton to Pakistan's persistent fiasco in Kashmir, looks like this Diversions, distractions work very well for these political leaders. Also works very well for Mark Zuckerberg. How? Huh? He monetizes by your eyeballs. A friend of mine is a general partner in a top tier fund. He often says, whenever they invest in startups, they are serving any of the deadly sins. That's his investment thesis. Do you know about what a deadly sense? No, sir. Coming late is one. No? No, it is not. Lust, anger, wrath, pride. Deadly sense. Tinder is lust. Look at any billion dollar company. LinkedIn is pride. Zomato is gluttony. Twitter is wrath. What is Instagram? Envy? Sanitra Vanity. Vanity. Yeah. It is everything. Envy, vanity, gluttony, wrath. So if you want to become a billionaire like Zuckerberg, monetize on these sins. Works very well. Especially for these general partners. I think that's what, is it? Can we trust OpenAI, Sam Altman on artificial intelligence? He did a very interesting interview with Bill Gates a few days ago. But anyway, coming back to Iran, do you think this idea of diversionary war applies in case of Iran? Isha, does it apply in case of Iran? Yes, uh, we can say that it applies. Oh. Iran was uh, going through some uh, economic challenges internally. Yeah, now we're thinking. See, it's a simple idea. The idea that domestic underpinnings dictate many aspects of country's foreign policy. What are the public sentiments in Iran? Widespread dis dissatisfaction with government policies in Iran. There's a violent crackdown on anti-government protests in Iran. Last year, I think... Masa Amini was killed and there were large-scale protests that swept across Iran. Is that it? Iran has been dealing with a range of economic difficulties. Isha would know. I mean, look at their currency. High inflation, subsidy issues. People are leaving en masse from, from Iran. And please take a guess. When are Iranian elections due? March 2024. And that is why this issue becomes important because Iran will be in newspapers even on the day when you sit for your UPSC interview. Let's look at a few videos of Iran. What's happening there? Because it is astounding, you know, the same group that they have claimed was causing issues for them. We've seen 2012, 2013, 2015, 2017, 2019. Same group has been attacking the 
Islamic Revolutionary Guards. But it's only then, a few months before election, they want to move ahead. Let's look at the video. Hailing gap has become a lifeline for Iranians who've lost their jobs. Arash Masumi is one of them. But a steep decline in the value of the national currency during the last two years has led to record high inflation. He had to close his shop in the small in Tehran four months ago after the rent doubled and his sales dropped. My main source of income now is from online taxi. My wife works too, but still, we can't make ends meet. We used to live in good areas of Tehran, but with time, we had to move to cheaper places. I had a good life before. I never looked at price tags, but today we think twice while buying cheap goods. Aras says the mall used to be crowded and the shops employed more staff. He says he wants to move to Canada like many of his friends. I'm not looking for luxury. I just want to live a normal life. If it's here a futile, we delisted or reduced numerous foods in our lives, such as dairy, certain fruits and meat. Eating outside is no longer an option these days. After Iran's economy was damaged by the pandemic and sanctions caused by former President Donald Trump's withdrawing the U.S. from the 2015 nuclear deal with Tehran and world powers, annual inflation reached about 50%. According to national statistics, the price of food has increased by 80 percent in a year, placing Iran among the first five countries with the highest food inflation rate in the world. Crippling U.S. sanctions are seen as the major driver in the sharp rise. The national currency has lost 50 percent of its value since the government led by President Ibrahim Raisi took office in August 2021. Raisi says tackling inflation is a priority, but many accuse the government of downplaying economic realities. The real has lost 29% of its value since nationwide protests following the death of 22-year-old Mahsa Amini in police custody last September. Poor economic growth and rising unemployment have also led to social unrest. You lost the planning, scenario planning for your business, for your life. And I think this is the most important reason for immigration of Iranian right now. Suffering from a loss of purchasing power, members of middle East class appear to be victims of inflation in Iran. And that could lead to some of them looking to leave the country and taking their capital with them. See now and there are innumerable videos. It's not just one story of what's happening in Iran. Just browse through and see if you can get access to today's Iranian newspaper. You will get the reasons. What's happening there? Any thoughts up until right now? So next parliamentary elections, 2024, 20, March, just a few months. Looks like demonstrating strength in foreign policy is a quick way to galvanize support or distract from intern, internal criticism. The way it has happened with Ronald Reagan, the way it has happened with Bill Clinton, to Benjamin Netanyahu. But now that's not a concern for me. I'm India. What about India and all this? Do you think India will benefit from the Pakistan-Iran tussle? Parth? No, sir. I don't think India will benefit because we have Chahbar port in Balochistan region of Iran, which connects India to Afghanistan and Central Asia. So, uh, and also it will, uh, it can increase uh, insurgencies or attacks in Jammu and Kashmir because of radical elements. So, these two points. So, let's are... assume one thing, one very interesting scenario. Let's assume that you are advising a prime minister, which I'm sure you all will do in some time. What will you advise him? You're seeing this war breaking out. You meet him in, let's say, PMO. What will you tell him? What should India do now? 
by the way for such questions at least the one that i asked do not give up give these absolutist statements that it will benefit india or it will ruin india yes or no no things are always in shades of gray for your personal you know doubt based questions you can give definitive answers but for such scenarios you have not done that scenario analysis you don't have any facts at least one qualitative or quantitative facts to come up to those conclusions so my advice don't give give these absolute statements but anyway let's come back to our story that you are advising the prime minister and you're seeing this playing out and this is happening even today what will you advise him if you were the foreign policy advisor isha what will you tell him um, actually you should closely observe the situation and uh, see if it uh, uh, retaliates uh, uh, to a higher level post which uh, india along with other supporting countries may raise the issue at un level but why would you do that i mean why would you watch or give me any practical answer it's okay to make mistakes completely fine sandeep prabha any thoughts so uh, closely observe for sure the other thing was that regional escalation to be honest to be honest i don't care personally about iran or pakistan i care about india yes That, exactly. i'm assuming would be your stance yes so how will you benefit so regional escalation is not in our interest especially with regards to any inflation that can happen we are already struggling with fuel, fuel inflation um india has been the voice of reason so we can continue with our stance of urging restraint at the same time the baluchi aspect is something that i would also be alert about because the baluchi citizens are generally pro india i i don't have facts on how the militant group that got struck how they uh, fare in terms of the local citizens there uh, but that's something we need to do we need to watch out for because that area is of interest to us other than that of course since iran did it uh, against a militant group and india let's that... assume let's assume that forget about the interview you pay the interview just put yourself in that role meeting the prime minister advising him what can we do now what should we do here you have such an incredible opportunity to decide on fate of so many lives so forget about interview that you're in the interview room just tell me honestly what do you think what should you do raise your hands i mean i'll call you out you want to prabha so with regards to our stance on terrorism i think this is a good opportunity to showcase that we we have been talking about this and it is a concern when it comes to pakistan state sponsoring terrorism so there uh, this is another country who has okay that's one uh, thing what else active in self defense that's basically what i think so you're building a case for yourself so it's one more data point here that's it yes for now okay waiting for 10 more seconds if anyone has any thoughts on this see if pakistan's or if iran's relations with pakistan goes for a toss logically speaking iran might seek to strengthen economic ties with other regional players which will also include india if iran's relationship with pakistan becomes strained why do you think it would be a strategic move for iran to seek other regional partnerships and where do you think india stands in this picture whether you like it or not india is a major regional player you know about that don't take notes on this we are just having a conversation so please engage in conversation whether you like it or not india is a major regional player it has a rapidly growing economy it's a natural choice for a country like iran to build and forge partnerships Iran is already aware of the growing Pakistani-China alliance. India could be a great hedge 
for Iran. Okay, from Iranian standpoint, India is a large market. Phenomenal opportunity for Iranian exports beyond just oil. Could be petrochemicals, could be fertilizers, agricultural products. And especially for a country like Iran, where you know that the American sanctions have crippled many aspects of the economy. Now, as an Indian, I want to work for India. This, all of this is beneficial for me as India. In fact, you should talk to your ambassador in Tehran. Is it ambassador or high commissioner in Tehran? Ambassador, I think Commonwealth is not the case with Tehran. So you will call your ambassador and ask him to set up a high level meeting with the foreign office. With sanctions limiting Iran's trading partners, Iran tussling with its neighbors, you should advise your prime minister. Now is the perfect time to negotiate with Iran. Perfect time to secure better trade deals with our Iran. Let's talk to Tehran in this case. Only when your friends or enemies are in such situations, from international affairs standpoint, you will realize that let's forge some new trading collaborations. So if you were to set up an office, official meeting with Tehran, what all will you discuss? First thing which I will personally do is that now is a perfect time to engage in signing long-term contracts for the supply of oil and gas at a favorable rate. Long-term contracts, not short-term. And if things work out well, and if you are much higher in the negotiation trajectory, Negotiate for potential, you know, the potential of India participating in the oil and gas explorations in Iran. See if you can get that. If nothing, if not, then let's settle with long-term trading contracts. Why, why would you just wait and watch otherwise? You should take actions. You have limited years, we should take actions. That's one. What else would we talk about? And are you all fine with setting up this, using this as an opportunity? I know it's very Machiavellian, but we are India civil servant. Or anything else that you would want to discuss at this point with Iran? If you were in the foreign office, what would you discuss? Sir, so, I would dis I would convey this message that not only India needs Iran, but uh, also Iran also needs India as much as uh, we need them. So uh, that way we can have... But you uh, don't convey such things. These are not implicit. Why are you wasting time in in those negotiations conveying this? We, we need to have hard points, right? With us, limited time, 15-20 minutes meeting. So tell me concrete points that you will put in your deal. Nisha, any thoughts from your end? Sir, the Farzad B uh, project, which was in Persian Gulf, which Iran uh, backed off from. So India can uh, press that it should get a, uh, like you said, exploration. And, uh, See, at the end of the day, negotiation should never feel like that you are the only winning party. Yeah. Otherwise, that's not thinking... negotiation. I think negotiation which... Bhutto did during Shimla agreement. That's a phenomenal way to negotiate. Yeah, Isha, go on. Yes. Uh, our cooperation and the work on the Chabar port is also not as uh, going forward with the same speed as we would have wanted. Look, we'll come to Chabar in some time because that's one thing that you all will speak of when you hear about Iran and India. What else? See, of course, you know, long-term contracts sorted makes perfect sense. There the additionally attacks, yeah, go on. attacks on merchant ships which Houthi rebels are doing. So India uh, can convey that the uh, security of Indian uh, ships or uh, ships bound to India can be insured by Iran. We will explore trade agreements, tariff reduction. We would explore mechanisms to trade in local currencies because you have to bypass sanctions. 
of course talking business is fine but will you do anything else just for the heck of the people because at the end of the day people should also feel good about india we might propose collaborations in education culture work towards strengthening people to people style foster mutual understanding perhaps promote tourism i think a few weeks ago this has been sorted you don't need visas anymore to travel to tehran both countries have rich traditions in herbal natural medicine ayurveda in india yunani in iran establish collaborative research in these fields don't just talk business talk about culture that's how you bring in people together of course you have to sign long term agreements that should be the book goal in your mind additionally see if you can go on with your oil and gas exploration activities in iran after some talks about business after some talks about culture talk about chabahar now what is chabahar see i don't want your entire answer to be around chabahar port that's the first thing that will come to your mind when you hear the word iran and india and why not it's a very significant collaborative venture between india and iran a strategic partnership indeed with two greatest civilizations and it has huge economic and huge geopolitical implications where is chabahar located isha uh in the persian gulf so what's so unique about chabahar versus other ports in iran why just chabahar I'm not aware of it. Chandrababu. It helps us uh, bypass Pakistan, and because Pakistan has Gwadar, so Chabar helps us get a alternate. Because Gwadar is invested in by China as well. See, unlike the other Iranian ports that are in Persian Gulf and requires navigation through Strait of Hormuz, Chabar is easily accessible from Indian Ocean. by the way do read about strait of hormuz especially in today's context let's in fact watch a video and the funny part is uh, this video is from i'll tell you how current affairs on rarely about current affairs now we're seeing something similar happening even today to what you will see in the video just make observation about the date when this video was uploaded it's 4 years ago right by the way elections in iran happen in every 4 years and we have one happening in march 2024 anyway i think you all are aware of all the important streets street babel mandeh bar alakka or so on so forth let's come back to chabahar why is chabahar important for india after watching this video no tell me any observations mm -hmm. or anything yes. now we can understand that chabahar will provide a presence to chabahar will provide a presence to india closer to the strait of hormuz which is which can be strategic for india as we are also dependent on oil trade heavily of course all of this will have implications but uh, that's not the primary reason i think initially chandrababu mentioned about gwadar india's answer to its india's answer to gwadar port is gwadar a part of china pakistan economic corridor under it is it yes sir it's a part of china pakistan economic corridor and it's extremely crucial part of that corridor strategically located at the mouth of the arabian sea entrance of persian gulf think about this this location of gwadar provides china with a direct access to indian ocean innovate reduces china's reliance on the strait of malacca geopolitically sensitive this gwadar can facilitate so much trade between china and the middle east africa 
and beyond. Can it also serve as a logistical base for Chinese Navy? Gwadar. India is concerned about Gwadar. Gwadar port is a crucial part of that string of pearls strategy, a critical pearl in that Chinese string of pearls. The proximity of a Chinese-led project to Indian borders, it's a major security challenge for India. What if China uses this for military purposes? So we all know about India and why is it, is it important for India? Shah Bahar, broadly in context to Gwadar. But what about Iran? Why is Iran concerned about Shah Bahar? What are their thoughts on Shah Bahar? They will also have some thoughts around Shah Bahar since they are also involved in that project. Sanjprabha? Economically, if we think about it, they could get birthing rights because if they have port infrastructure, I guess they could charge for uh, that. So that could be profitable. Would they be concerned about Gwadar? Would Iran have any concerns with Gwadar? Yes. What concerns? For, China, for India, we can make a sense, you know, Chinese control, Pakistan control, but what about Iran? So, uh, China, not even North. a place in America. Sir, Chabaha is the only uh, Iranian port which has direct access to Indian Ocean because others are in Persian Gulf region. So it is outside of the choke point of uh, Hormuz Strait. And Gwadar is uh, competing with Chabar port. So if Chabar port, port is developed, then uh, uh, the Gwadar port's relevance decreases because Chabar can uh, become the hub or center for trade in the region. So that is the competition which is giving to Gwadar. Good. So it, this is very logical. Good points. Yes. Success so of Gwadar... Yeah. It is China versus India also, ultimately, because Gwadar is supported, financed by China, and Chabar is being supported by India. So it's yeah. that game also playing out. Very nice. Success of Gwadar could redirect major trade energy routes away from Iran. Iran has the ambition to become a key transit route for Central Asia and Afghanistan. Gwadar could be a roadblock. And as Parth mentioned, Gwadar supported by China. And China is also a growing power. I know its economy is in shambles these days, but it's not for perpetuity. They are still a major power. And they will dictate from where should shipments go if they were to trade with Af Africa or Middle East. They may reduce dependency on other routes. Perhaps routes that are closer to Iran. Who knows? Traditionally, Iran has been the key transit route to ask, access the landlocked regions of uh, Afghanistan or Central Asia. In Gwadar, things may change. And also China's significant investment in, in, in China Economic Pakistan Corridor. It will, of course, dominate the routes. Also, Ch Iran also does not like Chinese influence. Iran is cautious about the growing Chinese influence in the region. Perhaps Chabar is indeed important for both India and Iran. Chabahar could be seen as India's answer to Gwadar port. Gwadar located, what, 100 kilometers east of Chabahar? India aims to counterbalance China influence in that region. And Chabahar, of course, provides access to Central Asian markets. Even today, Iran is a major source of oil. Chabahar could serve as a point of transit. And of course, we want to build those long-term collaborations with Iran, sign those long-term agreements on oil and gas. Long-term, not short-term, because this is the perfect opportunity for us. But now my question is, this Chabahar issue is not new. Development of Chabahar, we've been hearing since the time of Fatalberi Vajpayee, formally began in 2003, when the initial agreement was signed. 20 years have passed. What's the progress? Has there been any delay? 
every upsc interview same question same answer cha bahar but when will it develop and why is it not developing or is it not developing any thoughts anil no sir i am not well aware of it why the there was a recent struck issue which arose between india and iran and the project has been stalled for for some times i guess the what if i ask you I, this question in the interview what will you say so factually speaking formally this was signed in 2003 we are in 2024 what is happening and why is it happening we all realize the importance of the sport we all are aware of chinese string of pearls at least tell me the excuses that we can give to yes sir I'm, i do not have much clarity on this okay chandrabha tell me the excuses that india should have the first one would be ease of doing business for the contractors who are sent there whether it's reg with regards to safety or the investment security of the investment that they are making and them being able to operate uh, efficiently there were also challenges with changes in the uh, terms of trade as per the foreign minister the terms of um, sorry the terms of agreement uh, for the port iran has uh, changed that back and forth so there was an issue with that if i remember correctly okay see two golden rules you should follow in your interview the first is that you have to of course speak for approximately 30 40 seconds not beyond that that's one number two you have to have the answer first approach the most important answer should come first otherwise people will lose interest how can we forget that there has been sanctions on iran india continues to trade with iran despite the american sanctions that's fine but sanctions also have a role to play these sanctions affect the international financial system how easy or difficult would it be to procure the equipments with sanctions in place what will about the hurdles in technology transfers these american sanctions could be an issue right and this is logical i hope you all are reading at least newspapers so that's one what else there could be operational challenges logistical challenges where is this region sistan balochistan right where they are developing it so it's not just about building a port it's also about the associated infrastructure for the port and there are could be issues pertaining to terrain technology transfer coordination with locals and regional security as is the case always in that middle east in region instability in afghanistan so you all should have some reasons as to why there has been a delay because we will read this in the newspaper multiple times and if they ask you a question it's been for so long what has happened but bjp is saying these days that um, progress has been made since 2016 so is it because of our honorable prime minister is that correct that it's entirely because of modi ji that uh, you're seeing a lot of progress nothing happened during the time of congress is that a correct assessment and everything is because of the leadership of the current prime minister any thoughts anilin sir i believe that there is continuity in foreign policy and uh, the change cannot be drastic the relations have been strengthened year by year from early on as well so then do the north region between 2003 to 2016 progress not made from 2016 onwards we are seeing tangible improvements then what happened what's the change sir, regarding indo iran relations or regarding especially the chabahar port chabahar port that's chabahar. what i'm talking about so you're not giving credit to modi ji uh, 
I, I do not know, sir, what happened in between 2013 and 2016. So I couldn't. So of course, leadership is important. Yes, it's an ex you know, but other than leadership, external factors are also important. Because in 2015, Iran nuclear deal was signed, right? How can you forget that? And I'm surprised because for the past couple of days, you would be reading a lot about India, Iran, Pakistan issue in the newspapers. That's what I'm saying. That mechanical reading of newspapers at this stage will not help you. You have to go and delve deeper into issues. That is what they're going to probe you in the interview if you're discussing about current affairs. Otherwise, you know, just digging a hole for your grave in the interview. If you're not doing holistic, proper analysis of every subject, every topic that you're reading. Iran nuclear deal 2015, several international sanctions were lifted thereafter. What will this do? This will create more favorable environment for India to push for this job or project. And of course, Indian leadership, as any sane leadership would do, they took proactive steps. Trilateral agreement was signed in India, Iran, Afghanistan, May 2016. India made many commitments. They will develop the port. Clear frameworks, clear timelines were also laid out. Now, what are the challenges then? Are we still on track for the project completion? Parth? So one more point uh, due to which the increased impetus is there is also that uh, it is the, now the only route towards Central Asia because Pakistan has, after 2016 URI attack and all the other attacks, uh, the access through Pakistan got blocked. So Chabar became uh, more important. So we all understand the importance of Chabar and we also knew the psyche of Pakistan. Our diplomats, our civil servants, they're not first order thinkers. They knew all of these, these things will happen. But sir, there was a laziness sense of because it is considered that India... What laziness? There were sanctions. And sanctions have issues. No? So because it is generally believed that uh, India uh, delays in delivering the promises. Would you say that in the interview? No, sir. I am just saying to you. See, think like a civil servant in the interview whenever you are appearing for. Even for the excuses, don't give such excuses. Laziness. One excuse could be, yes, sanctions were there. Of course, we can work hard, we can do everything, but it has its limitations. 2016 sanctions lifted. Things perhaps changed from there on. But 2016 till 2024, if sanctions were lifted, then what, what's, what's stopping the proper development of the Shah Bahar port? Entire relationship between India, Iran hinges upon this, right? Every time we talk about Shah Bahar. We all know the relevant significance of Afghanistan, Central Asia for us. Are we still being lazy? Tell me new excuse. Nisha? The sanctions were lifted 2015 onward, but then after the deal broke off, they were again reimposed. Good. Common sense. When did that happen? 2017. I think 2018 it happened. Reimposition of sanctions. US withdrew from the nuclear deal in 2018. And they reimposed these sanctions on Iran. Complicating the situation further. Now, just for a second, think that you're Indian diplomats in 2018, and you're seeing this happening in front of your eyes. Okay. Just take yourself time travel 2018, and you're seeing announcements happening that sanctions are getting reimposed. We are all aware. We worked very hard for this job, our port. We have all, all our resources there, and we were very hopeful of it. But now with these sanctions, things are complicated. In fact, America is pressurizing you to not go ahead with Iran. And that's the time when U.S. withdrew from the nuclear deal. How will you react? Your prime minister just gave you a task that you have five to 10 minutes, negotiate a deal with the U.S. Get me waivers for this project. 
how will you get me waivers? Anilin? Sir, I would ensure that firstly, the national interest of India is upheld and... No, I will do that, but you not play the role. I'm, no. Let's say I'm America, you are India. Let's have a negotiation. We have told you that, you know, nuclear impositions are done. We are imposing the sanctions again. Nuclear deal is cancelled. And you are our ally. Please help us. How will you negotiate? Sir, I would explain the importance of Chabagar port for the India and the Indian Ocean. They are not class 11th kids. They know the importance of Chabahar. So how will you negotiate? Like, I would explain the importance what will you say? of... Tell me, the, tell me sentences. What will you say? Like, it will serve American interest also Very for, good. for countering China as well. Like, it can be an effective alternative to the Gwadar port, which China is developing in the Indian Ocean to take control of Indian Ocean. If Chabagar is led to develop, then it would be a good strategic initiative to have lesser influence of China in the Indian Ocean and have... Uh, India will be cooperative to America in that regard to protect. Okay, it. I'm saying that, okay, we'll, we'll deal with China separately. We'll figure out a, a different way. What else? But that's a very good point, by the way, Andalin. If you were saying this in the interview, hats off. But what else? It could ensure uh, better connectivity to Afghanistan as well, so that uh, there will be greater uh, transport and trade connectivity will be more ensured, so that we can have good development in Afghanistan to come. Think from power. American. Think from America standpoint. What do they care? Yeah. Like, That's how you negotiate, right? To lose control of Afghanistan as well. It was considered as erosion of South power. Uh, of America and Afghanistan as well. By developing Chabagar port or giving support to it, it can ensure that uh, the reasonable presence of Afghan America is felt there as well, so that it doesn't lose total control of that region. Okay, good. The goal is simple. We have to get a waiver for India, for Indian civil servant. We all know the importance of our, we don't need to reiterate the same thing again and again. You will use the rationale that America uses all the time. You will say that Afghanistan will collapse. Please care about the human lives in Afghanistan. What is their fault? Afghanistan is landlocked. We want to build this port because it is crucial drought for humanitarian aid to Afghanistan. It is crucial drought for economic aid to Afghanistan. And this is something that you as Americans should care about. Isn't this the reason why you set foot in Afghanistan? To build a stronger Afghanistan for humanity. Why punish Afghanistanis? Because you have something to do with Iran. Of course, your argument around counterbalancing China is fine. It's good. I think very well said. But I think this is how they would perhaps negotiate. You can also clarify, it's non-military project. Why can't we get this sorted? It's purely economic, purely humanitarian in nature. There is no evidence, nothing of military use. So it should not be a concern for America. Why sanction this? India did something similar. Waiver was granted to India for the development of Chabahar port. Do you think this Chabahar port aligns with the U.S. interests? I think that's a debate for another day. I think we'll limit limited time. So I want to circle back briefly to that India, to that Iran-Pakistan fiasco that we are seeing. We saw why it is happening. Is it a new thing or not? What could, what are the core reasons? It's not just Iran. I want to, you to frame answers from keeping all countries in mind, be it Israel or, or America or whatever. Domestic underpinnings will decide, dictate foreign policy. And we also saw how 
India could perhaps benefit. We will not sit. We have to take actions. That's why we are being paid salaries. Do something about it. How will you do it? You might negotiate long-term contracts with Iran. Perfect opportunity. Many sane countries do this. Leverage these opportunities of weakness. But is it? But if I were to ask you, what are the negative implications of whatever is happening with Pakistan, Iran for India? What will you tell me? Of course, Iran Pakistan conflict would be economic opportunity for India. Can help us renegotiate long term oil and gas agreements. India could leverage a strained Iran Pakistan relations to balance China that we have seen. But what can be the potential loss for India if this continues? Parth, Parth gave a good answer initially. He began with that, right? Go on. So first is that the Chabar port is in Iran's Balochistan region. So in India's investment will be under uh, threat if the conflicts escalate. And secondly, if Shia Sunni conflict uh, escalates, then it can lead to militancy in Jammu Kashmir region as well. So that's the second point. And thirdly, the conflict will also lead to uh, attacks on Indian ships. It can have implications there as well in the So for such answers, you can say that, you know, there can be three issues with it. First could be a geographical positioning. Second could be this. Third could be this. So that, and as a, someone who is judging you on that day, I have much, I much more idea that, you know, what is going to come. If you randomly generate many points, then I may lose interest at psychology. So for such questions, feel free to use that structure. Three, three reasons, two reasons. And say that up front. You don't have to do this for every answer, by the way. Don't make that mistake. What else? Isha, any thoughts? Iran being a major oil producer and a major partner in India's oil import, it may have implications for global oil prices and the trade for India. Good. What else? Do you think it's the right time to invest in stock markets at this stage? Um, I, I, looking at like short term horizon, one month. It, it is a high risk, high reward kind of an opportunity. So what kind of Although, company would you invest in? Oil companies. Okay, what happened to these oil stocks in the past? Yesterday, there was a crash, right? In a way, of the stock, these Indian stock markets. Okay, uh, Chandrabha, any thoughts from your end? Negative implications? Um, just the same. I think I would be repeating all of the points mentioned earlier. Nothing unique. Any new point, anyone? No one. I think any general point that you can make, if you're asked a question around war and such conflicts around the neighborhood, war is never good for the economy until and unless you are the weapon supplier. America made a lot of money. It's good for the economy for America. Or they joined in late in various phases. But generally speaking, it's not good for the parties that are involved in the war. These wars can also, especially when it's around our borders, are conducive to the growth of extremist ideologies and groups. Okay? Because if there is a conflict in Iran, Pakistan, it will lead to political instability, social instability. All the extremists, they look for such opportunities to recruit, operate, spread their influence. And all of this could spill over to India. Could be Pakistan today, could be Bangladesh tomorrow, the Maldives, who knows. 
And yes, of course, you know, war will strain Pakistan's resources, attention. And if Pakistan's economy, society further weakens as it is happening, they might want to blame someone for their mess. What if a new political group emerge? And they blame India for all the mess. What if the new general tries to get hold of seat with India, anti-India rhetoric to further stabilize their positioning? India is a rising economy. We can't waste time on that nonsense, participating in fighting other wars. The fundamental purpose of foreign policy is what for India? Anilin, any thoughts? What is the fundamental purpose of our foreign policy? To promote and uphold our national interest. Exactly, to make India grow, be it economically, socially, politically, whatever. That's what we care for. Getting embroiled in wars could be disastrous. Now, there are some who may say that, do you think it's the perfect time to, let's say, open a new front against Pakistan? Iran is already there on the one side. Don't you think it's the perfect time, perfect opportunity for India to get back Pakistan occupied Kashmir? How will you respond on this? Fourth. Sir, I think that it is our opportunity to get back POK. Because it, okay. it, Pakistan is engaged also in Afghanistan and Iran. So a two-front two war will get India an opportunity there. I'm looking for more reasons. Think like a civil servant. And someone who is advising Prime Minister. Your advice will have consequences. Think from that standpoint. We're hiring for civil servants. What you said is correct and wrong. It's debatable. Any, do you want to take another shot at this? Parth is, you know, adamant on his views. Let's occupy. Sir, this is what I believe, but if I have to be diplomatic or. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be diplomatic. You should care for India's interest. And then you should advise the prime minister. Now, what will you do? Is it in India's interest at this stage to occupy Pakistan, occupy Kashmir? Sir, waging a war will hamper the economic growth prospects of India at this stage because India is growing at a consistent rate of 7%. It will The uh, war obviously takes up a lot of resources which will hamper the growth prospects in other sectors. So in that term, a war is not because Pakistan is also a nuclear armed country and has threatened Good. to use them. So there are two nuclear weapon states. So that is also a thing. Can we casually say that let's occupy a perfect time? Why didn't you give this answer first? This seems much more rational to me. Of course, it's again debatable, but why didn't you give this answer first? So many times in my mind there is something else, but the answer which I want to give in an interview is something else. So, that conflict is also there. You should have some foundational principles when you're preparing for these interviews. We care for India. I don't care about any political party. I don't care, care about Iran or Pakistan. I'm going to be India's civil servant. For me, people of India matter. For me, government of India, governments come and go. But India as an entity matters. Now, what will benefit people of India? How can we leverage this position to ensure that people of India benefit? Then have that as a North Star and start taking decisions. Not just in the but interview, but also in civil services. Our defense minister has reiterated and stressed upon the fact that we will take back POK again and again. So what should we make of that? See, again, it's not an interview for being a minister. Dual morality comes in, not just with McAvely, but also in this case. See, politicians are different species. Let them fight political battles. 2019, Motiji also, before the elections, decided to go in for the surgical strike, right, in Pakistan, and then help him immensely. 
in the election ele- electoral campaign but you are not a spokesperson for bjp or congress at this stage so as a civil servant what will be your sane advice to the prime minister who is also an executive head of the government and give that advice and tell me the rationale also because now i'm thinking like i said my defense minister is saying that we should occupy it so should i do it parth yeah, so i will uh, i will give the minister or the prime minister both pros and cons and because the ultimate authority is give me those pros and cons talk to me right now so in terms of pros it is that it is a opportunity because pakistan and its military establishment is engaged in a uh, war or a conflict with iran so it is a window of opportunity and also we have seen protest in uh, pok as well in favor uh, of joining with india so there is a opportunity but cons include the economic impact which will uh, which will reduce the economic growth prospects of india secondly the threat by of by the way my favorite activity whenever i travel across the world is to read through newspapers of that specific country those are such biased piece of newspapers for all the countries be it serbia georgia north macedonia everywhere so i will not make conjectures based on what i'm reading in the national newspapers half of them are paid network 18 owned by mukesh ambani ji ndtv owned by adani ji and similarly same story across the world so anything else so at the all... end of the day just think how will your decision benefit people of india be it in the short term or the long term so the cons will include the economic impact the threat of a uh, nuclear attack or nuclear retaliation from pakistan and the third will be if the pok is integrated the population which is living there is uh, radicalized and we have to uh, look into the possibilities of spread of extremism in other parts of india as well so that are some of the cons Okay, Anilin, what do you think? How will you advise? So, Parth just mentioned Defence Minister is saying that should occupy that part of Kashmir. Any thoughts on this, sir? I would say that like India's cap uh, capability, and now there is a right opportunity to occupy POK, but it would not be uh, right to do so now, like. because it's a nuclear round country as well so it will lead to a nuclear nu- it may exaggerate to a nuclear conflict secondly uh, we have china chinese threat as well so we can't see pakistan in isolation there is clandestine support to pakistan always by china and we have border challenges with china as well it might embolden china and we couldn't defend and india has a good stance in the united nations and uh, consider us a follower of international law and we promote international law as well it might be uh, it might go against the values which which we promote and next there will be uh, now we are seeing that world order there is so much was occurring and it may sm- spill over to asia as well and it's it's greater threat to the world order as well let's see yeah. so it can and now india is seen as a bridge between north and south and india is a good diplomatic voice and its soft power is rising among all the countries so uh, it would not be the right time to wage a war against pakistan or occupy pok through military means we should have so is our defense minister wrong no before going for anything we should have perception management like Uh, like the other nations should most of the nations should accept as well that india is in the right stance so that we prevent more more antagonism towards india well we see there are so much antagonism now in the neighboring countries as well it might it might go in a wrong sense okay now let's assume that so i get your points anyone wants to add here anything chandprabha isha 
your positions, your stance on occupying, making the best of this opportunity. Should we go on to occupy that Pakistan's occupied Kashmir? Isha. I would also support uh, my other colleagues in their views. And uh, especially now that Indian economy is uh, one of the uh, growing economy in the world, we are uh, uh, going to touch 5 trillion mark by 27-28. Waging uh, a war at such a crucial time for the economy um, will be hampering. So then we will have to weigh uh, which is going in our national interest more. And uh, I believe that the economic progress will benefit the people of India more at this time than uh, the occupation of uh, um, POK. Secondly, okay. um, I also think that uh, this will uh, significantly hurt the trust and the credibility of India in the global world, which then has many repercussions. For example, Chinese investment in a country is seen at a particular with a particular viewpoint as compared to India. This action by India will then again uh, uh, will not help countries differentiate much between actions of India versus actions of Chinese. So, so this image is a major trust builder for India, which again has many economic benefits for a country going forward. We should be very cautious about hurting that image. Okay. Good. A part is fuming with anger. That we were supposed to occupy Kashmir. What is this? That's such part is the defense minister. And he says, okay, get your points, but we need to have spine. If you don't have spine, what is this nation? We have to take some hard stance. He's trying to convince you that no, you are. I think you are right about that, you know, there can be a risk of full-scale war. There can be international condemnation, isolation of India, who knows? Although, I don't think that will happen. There can be economic consequences, will of course happen. There can be humanitarian crisis, impact on our relations with other countries, treaties, environmental damage for those who have written about their activities, about ecology, environment, gardening as their hobbies. Strain on military resources. I agree with all your points. Violation of international law. And Pakistan is, I agree, it's a banana republic, but still it has a nuclear weapon. But let's assume that we are going with the idea to occupy Pakistan occupied Kashmir. And you are tasked to build a strategy in a way that nothing of these things happen. How will you do it? And what will you do it? I'll give you a hint. Take learnings from Tony Blair and George Bush. See how you can build a case if you were to do it. Because I agree. I think uh, Defense Minister is right. It's a good opportunity. But I won't say this out loud. That's a wrong move. Why would I give hints to the world that I am a country that takes pleasure in using the resources of other countries when they're at their worst. So I'll get the things done. And my task is that I want to occupy this part, which rightfully belongs to India. Now, how will you do it? Go on, Chandrabha. So we can use diversionary tactics, uh, like you mentioned earlier as well. So currently, the terrorist attacks have seen an uptick, especially around Rajori region. So what we could do is we could talk about, uh, again, launch pads for terrorism uh, from the POK area, if we have evidence for that, and then make that the agenda that we are going in for a surgical strike to first neutralize these launch pads. Uh, basically go for it from a, a counter-terrorism uh, perspective. And then establish a credible holding presence there. Of course, a lot in the long term we'll have to come up with more social and political solutions because i don't believe that the solution to pok is just military yeah, it's never military yeah it has to be beyond that you can't win the hearts of people how would you so, do it 
so leverage not just the people and not just the people of pakistan occupied kashmir but also the entire world entire so that world. they are with us how will you do it we need to have a credible uh, alibi firstly with regards to at least counter terrorism so we could use one of the incidents that happen tragically as a justification to go for a surgical attack is what i'm thinking but how will surgical attack in this case help we could justify See, the, what i'm thinking broadly is if india is fighting with pakistan that's an issue but if we can ga- gather the entire world to fight with pakistan no can we do something around that in the next 5 years 10 years any strategy of course i will first and foremost i will ensure that none of the youtubers uploading videos i'm just kidding they give out all these strategies that's true You can't say all these things out out in the public, right? That you know, India should occupy P O K. Not say if you want to do it, do it. <laughs> I say. Yeah. Tell me ten years strategy on how can India occupy P O K. Okay. Ten years. Okay, I think again we can go on and on, and we can of course come up with a strategy also. The time is up. What I want to say is that um, if you are reading any article today, we began with Iran and Pakistan. We delve deeper into why Iran is doing this. You give a wrong answer. It's doing it because of some terrorist attack. No, they have done this attack multiple times. Why is it doing it right now? and we got to the reasons that you know there are some domestic underpinnings and it's not just iran it could be israel been america been uk across the history been pakistan also and then we see as indian diplomats what are our own challenges how can we leverage this to secure india's interest interest of its people we didn't just stop there we then also looked at alternate scenarios why whatever is happening if you look at chabahar what's the reason why 2003 till 2024 not much progress made of course progress has been made i'm not saying that the no progress has been made in fact i think for afghanistan we did use it to send across uh, a lot of assistance that port was used only recently so the point is your mechanical reading of newspapers at this stage will not be helpful you have to pick two issues per day and go in length in depth of it and think of yourself as someone who is act- actually part of civil services and we saw how t- answers changed the moment i made part of that protagonist you have to play that role in the eventual interview just with that change in mindset i, I could see the really good answer that parth gave afterwards you're not there to just make other people they make your interviewer smile you can crack jokes but you that won't get you marks the goal is to actually genuinely care for india its people and solve things get things done and you have to put yourself in that role any thoughts about this i think this was the last session that we have had I was thinking of discussing uh, economics as well on how to address issues for in economics but i don't think we don't have the time for it go on chandra prabha so so i had written these down because what i was trying to understand is i i did think that there was a personal gap in terms of the depth that i'm able to go in while reading the newspaper for because of scarcity of time or the pressure to just look at all the topics and be able to at least answer something now the three things that i noted uh, noted for what is the tangible steps that i can take to ensure this is sort of coverage we do so you have given us the framework of questions we can ask so for example when i was studying iran and pakistan i didn't ask myself the question why now so that question itself was lacking i didn't think of it secondly uh, i've noted that i should at least focus on two issues per day in which i go into depth 
and being able to come up with that and i think within the newspaper i don't think there should be more than two or three papers uh, two, two or three issues that deserve that kind of depth would that be a correct assessment and then after that the mindset that think of it as a policy maker so this is basically what it is and also how do we plug the gap between thinking of the right questions to ask ourselves to train that mental muscle that how do we ensure we don't make the mistake of not questioning why is it attacking now will that come with practice and reading or <laughs> or what i can do is um, that i don't know how to solve that but what i can do is i can at least cover one issue with you every week although it was not part of the journey uh, but i can try my best to see if we can align our schedules so but i'm already seeing that uh, so can you so once your interview dates are out let me know and at least once a week we can deep down on issues could be climate change one day could be iran pakistan one day could be whatever the next day the reason i'm saying two issues per day is because uh, in the interview the interview will be just pick up the headline and then they will just probe you deeper 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 into it that will happen and if you are just surface for you know reading newspaper just for the views of that specific editor or that author it won't serve the purpose you have to think beyond that it's just fine for clearing prelims and pains but now you have to play the role of a policy maker you have to be the one who comes up with those opinions you should not be the one who just reads the opinion so you should have clear cut positions and opinions about how can we manage india's flood that we did the last time you should have opinions about how we can actually occupy it okay not a big deal we can do it if we do things diligently it may take time but it is possible and we can do it in a way it won't hamper india's growth it may sound controversial today but who knows 5 10 years of good strategy achievable and at the end of the day you have to think about india i know the concept of nation state is waning and there's a huge debate around it but uh, at this stage we care for india's growth india's people and that's what we plan to serve right it's who we plan to serve Nisha, any thoughts on the on the discussion today? Uh, I it was very enriching discussion, especially because I was also facing this issue myself. That it is like a trade off for me. Either I can read wide, or then I can pick up a topic and deep dive into it. Because deep diving into one topic feels as if uh, we don't have the cut off uh, in mind, and uh, it can continue for one day. and then the other day it feels as if uh, yesterday i missed out on a lot of other things so we then postpone the deep diving for a later date so i myself was having this issue a lot and uh, now that you have suggested two topics per day even that um feels a bit difficult to me like how will i manage two topics into depth they took us what approximately 90 minutes to wrap it up today because uh, you already have a very uh, um wide uh, um, knowledge about many things already to cover this i may will have to read uh, um many articles or watch some videos and then be able to have a comprehensive overview start with one at least mm -hmm. let's have yes. realistic targets again you know you all will read newspapers but if you're not deep diving those current affairs could be disastrous for you they're not checking for facts yes. at this stage they're checking how you are forming your own opinions of course everyone will have views around occupying that part of kashmir how you talk about it that's also important in the interview anilin of you You joined in late, so you missed out on the fun part. Ah, uh, yes, sir. I was forty minutes late. It was good analytical, so I could think more on the issues. Like, 
I believe that taking up an issue and thinking for half an hour will give me more insights rather than reading so much. After reading things, I should sit down and think for half an hour, I feel, so that I can frame things well. And I should have clarity. I can have clarity in my mind first to speak out with confidence. Okay, good. So the go. So if you all can promise me that you will be coming here on time, then it makes sense for me to do extra efforts, and I will try because this is not what was initially promised. But if you are yourself not coming up, coming in late, delayed, then all my effort goes to waste. Okay, so I'm happy to do it because I want you all to score the highest in the interview, but there should be diligence at your end also. Parth, go on. Sir, today I came late because I did not receive the link. So I then emailed and uh, said that I have The link is the same, the right? Link. It remains same for all the sessions. Okay. And if there's any change so... in the link, then we'll let you know. But at this stage, at least for the past three sessions that we had and still in the timetable as well, it remains the same. Okay, sir. I didn't know this. Okay, so what are your observations you're learning from today? Sir, I am reading currently two newspapers and I had the same issue that I, did. I am not getting time to deep dive into some topics like you have told. So it would be better like in a discussion format like we did today. So it really gives an insight and also saves a lot of time. Just let me know whenever the day is final, finalized for you. We'll plan things accordingly. Okay. All right. So now I think I have an office. In... Okay, I have a mock with Chandraprabha. So yeah, we can wrap it up today. And uh, I think we'll have one-on-ones every week with some of you. We've already spoken about it. And you all will receive the links. Okay. All the best. Take care. And Chandraprabha, we can do that uh, mock on the same link. So let's join the same link in two minutes.